Hello everyone, my name is Mark, and today we're going to be looking at the higher level 2022 physics paper. We're going to be looking at question 5, which is an experimental question, and yeah, let's get straight into it. So question 5 here, as I was saying, is an experimental question, and in this case it's going to be working with, um, it's going to be working with heat predominantly. We're going to be looking to verify Joule's law, which is one of the questions that we'll come to later, and we're going to be working with um, specific heat capacities of different substances, and um, a few other things like that. So yeah, let's get straight into part A. So having a look now at part I here, the first thing I'm going to be asked to do here is to draw a label diagram um, of how the apparatus was arranged in this experiment. So a label diagram obviously needs to include your labels. Majority of the marks are actually going for those labels. So um, it's all well and good drawing this, you know, really good um, diagram, but it really needs to have those labels in order to get you your full marks. So what we're going to do is take you through the diagram and then kind of point out the important buzz terms that the examiner is looking for. So it's easier for you to um, get your full marks in this question. So yeah, now we have our diagram drawn in and there's going to be a lot kind of going on here. So we're going to take you through all of the labels first and then we're going to highlight the important labels that you need to include to get your full marks. So the first thing we're going to be looking at here is actually going to be our digital thermometer. So our digital thermometer is going to be this kind of um, box on the top left and it's going to display our temperature. Um, another thing to note is just for kind of explaining the whole system, you're also going to have this probe in the um, oil in this case, your olive oil, and that probe is going to be the thermometer as well. So you can kind of draw the arrow pointing to this at any point. It's just kind of the same system. Building on that, you're also going to have your heating coil, which is going to be this kind of curly looking um, element inside of the oil. And that's going to be used to obviously heat the oil and um, yeah that's an important thing to include. Moreover than that we're also going to have everything kind of around um, around the heating coil so you're going to have the heating coil is going to be submerged in oil or olive oil um, and it's also going to be kept in a calorimeter which is going to be this thicker kind of box surrounding the whole system and then it's going to be topped off with a lid which is this thing on the top. So just kind of round all that up what you're going to have is you're going to have uh, your heating element and your digital thermometer are going to be sitting in some oil. That oil then is going to be uh, sitting in a calorimeter and then that calorimeter is going to be topped off with a lid. Um, so that's kind of everything that's going on there. And um, another important thing you need to remember is going to be the circuitry behind the system. So what you're going to have here is your ammeter, which is going to be this kind of A with a circle around it. Um, and an important thing to know here is that when I drew this ammeter in, it's going to actually be in series. It's not going to be in parallel. It's going to be in series. So that's an important thing to do when you're drawing out the circuit. Make sure your ammeter is in series. Moreover, we're also going to have a form of power. So we have a power supply, which is going to be, in this case, represented by these kind of long and short um, arm little thing here, which is basically the notation for drawing a battery. And the reason that I've gone with the battery here is that it just kind of makes sense in the circuitry. You could draw in a power supply itself. That's completely fine. But a power supply or a battery here would get you your full marks. So now that we've shown you everything that's going on here, what I'm going to do is take you through all of the marks and highlight the important terms. So there was 12 marks going for this question. And the breakdown was as follows. You got three marks for including the heating coil, which is an important thing to remember when you're um, labeling this diagram. Uh, moreover, you're going to get another three marks for including your digital thermometer. So you get another three marks there. Building on that, you're also going to get some marks for the circuitry behind the system. So you're going to get three marks for drawing in your ammeter. Import error. It's an important thing to note that it's going to be in series. Drawing it in parallel actually won't get you your marks here. And then um, on top of that, we're also going to have our form of power, which I've just drawn in here as a power supply or battery. Both these are perfectly fine. Now you might be asking, well, why do we bother with all of the um, labeling of the elements kind of actually doing the heating? So the heating coil, the calorimeter, the oil and the lid. The reason I included those is because it's important to understand the whole experiment. Um, and even though you might not label them actually doing the experiment itself, you still have to draw them in here to get your full marks. So there's no harm in having a look. So taking a look now at part two here, what we're going to be asked to do is to actually find out how the mass of the olive oil itself was determined and um, this might be kind of like a difficult question at first but it's actually a very simple process. So taking a look at the answer here the actual kind of process that was used to determine the mass of oil is that we first need to subtract the mass of the empty calorimeter away from the mass of the calorimeter when it has been filled with the olive oil. So basically if we fill the calorimeter with olive oil and then weigh it we're going to have a certain weight and then if we fill it uh, or mass it I say um, and then if we um, just measure the mass of the empty calorimeter and then subtract them away, what we'll be left with is the mass of the olive oil, which is what we're being asked to find in this question. So for getting this correct, you're going to get a total of three marks. And the way that you kind of approach this question is going to be how you get those three marks. So saying, you know, you subtract the mass of the empty calorimeter away from the mass of the calorimeter that's been filled, that'll get your full marks. Um, and that's kind of just the kind of main way that you actually do this question. So taking a look now at part three here, what we're going to be asked to do is to draw a suitable graph that verifies 
Jules Law. And as always with these questions, um, you're given a table of information. And what we're going to do is have a look at that table of information. And sometimes we need to make some changes to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the original table and then have a look at a table with the arranged uh, or the needed changes so that we can actually um, plot our graph here and verify Jules Law. So here is the two tables that we need um, to kind of have a look at before we actually get into drawing the graph. So in this first table up the top here, this is going to be the table that we're given in the question, and that's completely fine, but we need to make a few changes to it. And the notable one here is that we're going to actually need to square um, the current present in order to get it into a form that we can actually use in our graph. So for the second table down here, and what we all we've done is we've squared each kind of current here, and um, each value for i, and that's going to give us um, a new table. And an important thing to note that we've also done here is we found the change in temperature. So what we've done is subtracted away the final temperature from the original temperature, and that gives us our change um, in temperature. And that's important here as well, because we're going to be plotting these two things against each other. So if we take a quick look at the graph that I have drawn out here, there's no points plot on yet, but we can actually kind of just have a look at what we're doing. And the first thing we're going to be noticing is that we're going to be plotting the current squared. This is going to be um, I squared from the table above versus that change in temperature, which we said was delta theta. And we're going to be plotting those against each other. So that's the important thing to note there. And um, yeah, what we're going to have is we're going to have various units for that and we're going to plot them. So plotting our points on the graph here, we're going to be plotting is I squared versus our change in temperature. And if we look at the table that we actually found after we squared our temperature and found our change, or sorry, say squared our current and found our change in temperature, if we plot those points on our graph, we're going to get a um, kind of a points that look like this, if you will. And um, what we're going to do now is have a line of best fit put in. And yeah, that will be the end of our graph. So here is our line of best fit in purple. And what you can see here is that it goes through actually the majority of these points and it also goes through our, um, our origin, which is exactly what we needed here to verify Jules' law. So going on to the marking for this question, there's a total of 12 marks going and the marks went as follows. You got three marks for correctly drawing out your um, kind of new table with all the information that we need to change. So you're going to be have, you're going to have your I squared and you're also going to have your delta theta. Um, and then building on that, you're also going to get three marks for labeling your axes correctly, three marks for correctly um, drawing your points on the graph. And then you get another three marks for drawing the correct line of best fit, which in this case, in our um, graph here, does go ahead and verify Joule's law. So moving now on to part Part four here we're going to be asked to do is to calculate the slope of our graph. So what we're going to first do is pull up our graph that we were looking at previously, and then we're going to be using um, a formula from the coordinate geometry section of our log tables in order to find the slope of that graph. So here is the graph that we were looking at in the previous question, the one that we drew up. And what we're going to be asked to do is calculate our slope. Now the formula for finding the slope of a line, so m is going to be our slope here, is going to equal to y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. And this is a formula that you can find in your log tables in the coordinate geometry section. The important thing to note here is that when you're plugging information into this formula, you want to pick points along the line. You don't want to pick points um, that you actually just drew in. So for example, we wouldn't want to pick this point here exactly because this point is slightly off the line. What we're actually really interested in is the slope of the line of best fit, which is a little bit different. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to identify two points along the line of best fit, and then we're going to plug these into our formula to get our slope. The first point that I'm going to pick here is going to be the one at the very start, which is going to be 0, 0. The reason I'm going to be picking this is because it's going to be going through the origin, which is really nice and easy because it means that um, the formula gets a lot easier. It'll be just the um, y2 over x2, for example. Now, all we have to do is pick a second point. So the point that I'm going to pick is going to be this one towards the end. And I'm going to use that because it gives us a nice long average line. So plugging our information in here, we're going to have m is going to equal to y2. Now, y to in this case is going to be in around 22 here and then minus y1 which is going to be zero and the reason it's zero is because this point down here is going to be zero zero and i'll just write this up here this point looks to be about um 22 comma uh we'll say that that is about 50 and what we're going to do here is have our 22 minus zero and then on the bottom we're going to have our 50 minus zero again and then we're just going to plug this into our calculator so if we plug this into our calculator the answer you're going to get here is 0 0.44 and and you might get a slope that's slightly different and that's completely okay and the reason you might get a slope that's slightly different is your line of best fit might be a little different to mine. But as long as you get anything in and around, so I'll just say um, anything in and around 0 0.44, um, 7 I think is the correct answer here, uh, anything in and around that, 
um, with a little bit, you know, a little bit of tolerance either side, I guess, and you'll get your full marks. So yeah, for this question, there's a total of six marks going, and the breakdown was as follows. There was three marks going for getting your slope function, which in this case is um, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and then your slope itself getting the correct answer, which in this case we got 0.44. Um, but another thing to know here is that like the correct answer, the perfect answer, would be 0.447. So that's an important thing to know if you get something slightly different, as long as it's in and around that. So moving on to the final part here, in part five, we're going to be asked to calculate the specific heat capacity of the olive oil. And this is quite a tricky question. And there's a few observations you kind of have to make first. And um, some information has to be taken out of the question as well that we haven't looked at yet. So the first thing to note here is what we want to do is have an equivalent setup between the energy that's going to be going into the heating element and also the energy that's going to be used to actually heat the olive oil. So what's actually really happening here is that when we pump electricity through the heating element, energy is going to go into the um, heating element and that's going to be transferred into the olive oil and that's going to cause that olive oil to change temperature and basically there's going to be a transfer there that's going to be happening which means we can use two formula and let them equal to each other um, and we can build on from that. So the first thing that we're going to note here is we're going to be using the formula for Joule's law which is going to state that p is equal to i squared or where power is going to equal to the square of the current times the resistance. Now we're not really interested in power um, in particular here we're actually interested in kind of like the work done and the energy transfer here uh, and what we already know is actually, well, you know, power is going to equal to the work done per unit time, the work uh, divided by T, which means that if we want to isolate work or the energy transfer here, what we're going to have is if we multiply across by T, we'll get I squared or T is going to equal to the energy transfer. Now, what we already know, though, is that there's actually going to be another formula that's going to be happening here. And as we were saying earlier, and um, the energy is going to be transferred from the coil the heating element to the um, olive oil. And that means that there's going to be, the olive oil is actually going to change temperature. And that's going to be represented using the formula Q is going to equal to MC delta theta. Now you can find all these formulas in your log tables and we're going to take a look um, in a minute just at where they are. But the first thing to know here is that what we're going to do is actually let these equal to each other. And the reason that letting those equal to each other is because what's happening is the energy used to heat up the coil is going to be transferred into that olive oil. So what I can say just in here is therefore, we're going to have MC delta theta is going to equal to i squared or t. So going to page 61 of our log tables here, the first one of interest that we're going to take a look at here is going to be the formula that's going to represent Joule's law. And in this case, it's going to be this formula here, which is p is directly proportional to i squared. So I'll just write that out again, p is proportional to i squared. And if you want to turn this into um, kind of a more rigorous formula without that proportionality in there, you're going to have to multiply by some constants. So we can say that p is going to equal to i squared times a constant, which in this case, the constant is going to be the resistance. And now we're just going to have a look at our second formula here, which is going to be um, the formula for energy. It's going to relate um, our mass and our heat capacities and everything like that. So let's have a look at that now. So having a look now at the heat and temperature for our section of our log table, what you'll find is that the energy needed to change the temperature of the olive oil is actually modeled by this formula here, which is what we were looking at previously, delta E equals mc delta theta, where delta E is kind of just the same as, I wrote it as Q, it basically just means the, um, the, the change in energy, the energy associated with it. So now that I have let these two formulas um, equal to each other, what we can actually do is now go ahead and start rearranging. Now, in the question, we're asked to find the specific heat capacity, which in this case is represented by this C here. So what we can do is actually go ahead and rearrange our formulas to get C on its own. So we're going to have C is going to equal to I squared or T, all divided here by um delta theta and what we actually what you might have already noticed is that i squared divided by delta theta is something we've already had a look at we actually found that in the previous question which was the slope of our graph which means we can actually go ahead and um rewrite this and i'll just rewrite it over here what we can have is um now we used m for the slope of the graph so i'm just going to have i squared over delta theta here i'm just going to have that on its own and then multiplied by or t over m and basically this section over here this left hand kind of portion is already something we found. It's going to be the slope of the graph in the previous question. So if we go ahead and plug in all of the formula or the information given to us in the question, what we'll be able to do is actually find our answer here. So if we scroll down here, what I'm going to do is throw in all of the information that we know. So we're going to have C is going to equal to I squared over delta theta, which is going to be our slope, which we found to be 0 0.44. And that's going to be in here. And then we're going to have multiplied by our resistance. Now, in the question, our resistance was given to us. It's actually 8.5 ohms. So I'll just write that in there, 8.5 ohms. And then we're going to have our time t. Now, this was told in the question, or given to us in the question, should I say, as well. We were told that this is over the course of three minutes. Now, time is measured in seconds, the SI unit. So if we want to have three minutes in seconds, that's going to be three 
times 60. And then on the bottom, we're just going to have now our mass, which is um, going to be 35, or should I say 350 grams, which in kilograms is going to be 0 0.35. And the reason we have 0 0.35 returning into kilograms is because we're using our SI units here. So now that we've plugged everything into our formula, what we just have to do is throw this into a calculator and get an answer. So pulling up my calculator here, what I'm going to do is go ahead and plug in all the information that we know. So we're going to have our 0 0.44 on the top times our 8.5 ohm resistance multiplied by our three minutes and seconds which is going to be three times 60 and then on the bottom we're going to have our mass which was 30 150 350 grams turn this into kilograms is 0.35 and we'll get an answer here of 1923 and i'm just going to write that down here So the answer here is going to be 100 or 1,923 joules per kilogram um, per Kelvin, which is kind of a mouthful in terms of a unit, but that's all the units that you need to include. And the important thing to know here is that you might get a slightly different answer to this 1,923. You might have gotten something a little bit more, um, if you kind of got your slope to be a little bit more kind of perfect, I guess, if you were a little bit more careful with it, you would probably get a value in around 1,900. 54, but kind of anything in and around here showing how you manipulated your formula, showing how you kind of realized that there was an energy equivalence here will get you your full marks. Speaking of full marks, there was a total of seven marks going and the breakdown was as follows. There was four marks going for kind of deriving your equation here. So making sure that you let the, um, you know, change in energy associated with the olive oil, your formula MC delta theta, and making that equal to your formula for Joule's law, but making sure you convert the Joule's law, I guess, appropriately. And then building on that, you got another three marks for getting your answer correct here at the end.